You're listening to the Racer to Racer podcast presented by Race 92. Race 92 is a Venice-inspired racing apparel brand specializing in celebrating vintage race culture and adapting to motorsports today. Check out race92.com for all your racing merchandise needs. I'm your co-host, Aaron Mack, the other co-host. You may have seen him walking out of a great club with a big old smile on his face. You've probably seen him at a dirt track. You'll see him at Mid Ohio Sports Car Course this coming weekend. On Saturday, it's Scott Bowie. Mr. Bowie, how are you? Good, Aaron. And if anybody's paying attention, they'll see you there as well. They sure will. They'll see you there Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Yes, they will. Come come rain or high water or no or no AC, I will be there. <laughs> That's right. It's... Well, I'd say no AC is a good reason to get out of Indianapolis for mid-Ohio. Absolutely. Well, um, so today our show is Tristan Vadier, which we talked about last week. Drove the Indy 500. He's currently driving an IMSA and the Daytona prototypes. Or I don't know. Is that what they even call those cars anymore? I'm, that's what I call them, but I, I yeah. don't think that's what they're called. <laughs> Probably not. Well, anyway, he's in the prototype cars. Um, you know, great guy. Very great um, discussion for sure. And I think everyone will enjoy that interview and he's someone who um you know kind of dominated the road to indy was very successful and you know kind of went through the ladders and you know now you know he's having a pretty good sports car career i know he's won some races so sure um and i know you know if there's still an indy car opportunity out there for him i know he would take it which he you know kind of talks about a little bit yeah you know it's uh it's like anything else man you just unfortunately IndyCar can be kind of a revolving door and yeah uh, but if you got the talent you can often land in other types of racing and and uh you just man sometimes it's just a luck of the brakes in IndyCar it really is and uh more than way more than NASCAR you know uh, or even F1 really I mean that, or of course F1 they've they've been in those team systems for so long you know, there's so many guys over there that are like test drivers or whatever you would call them, you know, sim drivers, I guess, today, and uh, who never really even get to drive the, who never get to drive on race day, you know. But uh, it, it's just, auto race is a tough business. And unfortunately, it doesn't always completely end how you want it. But Tristan was a great talk, um, good guy extremely uh nice and um yeah i mean it's it's great he's still you know has a career and he's still racing man every time i think of tristan vadier he drove for sam smith motorsports and one of his sponsors one year of the 500 was um it's like coastal sunglasses or something and they handed out these blue sunglasses i, I probably still have one somewhere i still remember that <laughs> i didn't know that I, I never you get you get around a lot more than i do I, uh, I, I stay, uh, I stay more, a little more secluded than you do. We, we have to, we have to shield Scott Bowie from all the, the fandom. <laughs> I think he just has to shield him from the sun. <laughs> the sun? I don't know, man. I see. I mean, after the podcast a lot, I'll go out to eat and, you know, I've, I've run, I've ran into you several times. So, <laughs> and always, we've never even discussed it. That's the crazy part. Twice. Yeah, three times three times i'm sure yeah well um so racing news no indycar obviously next weekend's indycar mid ohio um good friend of the show jagger jones has three races so we're we'll both be there watching him and excited to see how that goes i definitely you know have good feelings about it for him yeah i, I hopefully it, it's a good weekend for cape motorsports as a whole and um that's a tightly contested championship battle right now in USF 2000. Um, Jagger, as he was leading after the speedway, and I think he's like fifth in points now after just a couple more races. Yeah. So it's just super tight. Um, yeah, what as far as racing over the weekend, stock cars were at Nashville, and I, I believe Chase Elliott won. Yes. Um, Everybody was just talking about how hot it was. I guess uh, 
some of the drivers, I don't know if it was the Xfinity race or the truck race. I think it was the Xfinity race. Uh, Natalie Decker and Vargas, I guess, had to get some medical attention after the race. Um, Larson, they interviewed him. He said that he didn't bother him. But, you know, Kyle runs all the time. He's never out of a race car. So My cat says just, so, too. Yeah, I know. I saw the, that. The one time I don't close the door. He decides right. he wants to be on the podcast. That's all right. He's allowed. Yeah, absolutely. Simon's been on the show. Why not uh, Ralph? Yes, he has. Um, but other than that, I guess uh, some of the big news in IndyCar, I guess there is a little news. I mean, Rokit is... Was that official, for... though? Has that been official? I, I mean, I, I, it's unofficially official. That would appear. It's, it's definitely making the rounds that Rokit... And AJ Foyt Racing are not going to continue their deal, it would appear like. Um, for whatever reasons, I, some might it look, it would appear financial from what I'm reading. Um, so hopefully something gets worked out there. Uh, Rosenquist says he is staying with McLaren, mm -hmm. but he but, they haven't yeah. made it official whether it's Formula E or. Um, IndyCar. Well, he did come from Formula E, so I mean, I, it would make sense, but you know, hopefully, it's IndyCar. But, um, yeah, I guess we'll have to see what happens with that. By there, I mean, yeah, McLaren's gonna be have a lot of, I mean, they so they have Pato obviously guaranteed for next year and Rossi. Um, right. so it'll be interesting to see what they do for the 500. I don't see Montoya coming back, I don't either. Um, you know, talk is that we're gonna run a third car full time. Now that may have changed, or it may be changing. Um, yeah, so it's going to be really interesting to see what goes on there, uh, McLaren, McLarens, because uh, we'll, we'll, I forget how it works now, but they've got kind of a driver development thing with with sure. uh, Colton Herta as well, yeah, yeah. with aims on F one. So I don't know where that leaves anybody either, but um, yeah, no, it's it's the Silly season's already started, and it's going to get really interesting before this year is over. And the winter time, well, I'm sure we'll have a few surprises as well. Oh yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I'm trying to think. I don't think there's really much more racing news. No, a friend of the show, Tanner Holmes, was involved in a pretty nasty-looking sprint car crash okay. over the weekend. Uh, would appear that he is okay though. Um, so I'm glad to see that. Um, but, uh, other than that, I, I don't have any big news. USAC was up at, uh, Sun Prairie last night, run sprint cars, Robert Blue won. Um, so that's all I got. Well, I think it's um, important to say that we officially have over 200 subscribers now on YouTube. Yes, it is important. And now I'm going to have to do something for that. <laughs> now. Well, we have we have a couple we have we've had a couple things we've we've had planned for Mr. Bowie, um, and we have at least ten people on board with one of them. But yeah, I, I'm Bowie gonna, has officially declined for the time being. I I no, not for the time being. I have vetoed that outright through my executive <laughs> powers. Um, but uh, we will announce something here in the next couple of weeks. We we will do something to commemorate the two hundred subscribers on YouTube. Uh, so thank you to everybody on YouTube and thank you to anybody who's subscribed to us on any platform. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And, um, yeah. Obviously the last episode was Chris Neifel, which um, was a great interview. Great guy to talk to. Doesn't do a whole lot of interviews. So it was really cool, really cool to talk to him. And we, it's, it's got a lot of views so far. And, you know, when we say on YouTube, like also obviously we're on Apple podcasts and Spotify. Um, we don't see the direct numbers from that necessarily roughly but um you know youtube is a lot more direct and we definitely appreciate everyone listening and watch, watching on all platforms absolutely we do and we have um some more other uh other types of videos coming out that aaron's working on and uh you know we just keep having things in in uh, works and some will happen some won't i'm sure that's just how it always goes but yeah it's this year is going to be exciting for us as well. And the off season is going to be exciting. And, um, man, it's been a, it's been a fun ride so far. 
Yeah, it's been an absolute blast. It's definitely crazy how far we've come in just a little over a year. Right. Yeah, and you know, I mean, yeah. I mean, that's, yeah, it's just amazing, like, just the little bit, you know, I mean, you know, the people, I mean, people listen to us every week, you know, I, I just, I really appreciate that. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's very humbling. Yeah, no, absolutely. So next week we're going to release our episode with Davy Jones, which was a great interview. Yeah, it was, that was fun talk. Davy, great guy, great racer. Um, so yeah, that, that'll be fun. And then in the coming weeks, we have an Indy 500 winner. We will be releasing along with, um, I guess you can say one of the all-time racing greats, right? At least in the dirt track racing. Oh, he is. Yeah, his numbers are pretty stellar. So uh, we're looking forward to that. And we are we definitely have other guests that we're lining up. And uh, we'll be doing interviews with them as well. So... Uh, man, we just we have a great lineup of guests we we've yet to interview, but we've discussed uh, times with. Um, so and and then uh, you know it's six months away, but we got our Chili Bowl broadcast coming out again this January. So man, I mean, it's just like that kicks off our year, and it's just fun uh, to do that, and um, and it just starts everything all over again. Absolutely. Well, um, yeah, thanks everyone for watching and listening. Make sure you hit like and subscribe. And like Scott said, you know, we'll have some other videos and stuff we will be releasing and other things we are working on. So thanks everyone for the support. And until next week, have a great week. Thanks, everybody. Our guest today won the 2012 Indy Lights Championship and drove in two Indianapolis 500s. He is currently driving the JDC Miller's number no. five Cadillac DPI entry in the 2022 IMSA. WeatherTech Sports Car Championship. We are joined by Tristan Vadier. Tristan, thank you so, so much for joining us. How are you doing? I'm good, thanks. Thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So I've always kind of had more of a background in IndyCar racing, so that's when I was first introduced to you through um, Indy Lights and obviously IndyCar. Um, but talk a little bit about how you first got interested in racing. Um, started pretty young. My dad... Um... My dad raced himself and then he, he started a race track, uh, like a road course in France when I was four. So I kind of grew up um, on the race track, you know, like when I was not at school, I was like he was living on the race track. So that's kind of where I was living as well. And uh, when I was not at school, I was there. So it was just I had a, I had a rental cart, right? And there was a karting track next to the, the road course. and. I had, a, I had a rental cart and I would just drive it, um, you know, in my off time. There was not much else to do either because it was in the middle of the country. So, uh, uh, and then step by step, I just got more and more into it. And I think when I was nine, I asked him for a, for a proper racing go-kart and I asked him to, to, to start racing. Yeah. So at that point, I mean, did you have any racing goals? Like growing up, did you watch like, you know, Monaco Grand Prix or Indy 500? Like, did you have any goals as a young kid? To I was watching F1 from very young. Like, mm -hmm. I, I remember, like, my mom's videos from me, like, being probably, like, five, uh, watching uh, watching Schumer, uh, Michael Schumacher and Damon Hill uh, fighting and stuff. So, uh, no, I watched it from pretty young. Um, but I guess, yeah, it's, I was nine when I really realized, yeah, I want to do races, you know? Like, this is, I, I want to get, like, serious about it. But... Uh, but no, I, yeah, it's always been kind of uh, in me and, uh, and uh, yeah, I was looking up, I guess, you know, when I was kind of old enough to really understand what was going on, the, it was during the, the fights between Michael Schumacher and uh, Mika Hakkinen. So I was a big fan of Michael and uh, then he had this big streak of wins, you know, championship titles and stuff. So that was right, you know, before I got serious into go-kart so I uh yeah I guess he was kind of the the guy you know you you look up to and um and yeah so so that's kind of how it all uh, it all clicked yeah well so you so you did kart racing what was your first like um formula car that you drove or first like actual race car I actually drove a race car for the first time at 12 
on my dad's track. I could barely touch the pedals. I was like laying down in the car to try <laughs> to get my feet further enough to touch the pedals. And I was like this close to the steering wheel. Like I have a picture where it's like, I think there's like the front of the cockpit and the back. And I'm like, it was like one third to the front of the cockpit. And it's like, well, he's like literally in the steering wheel. And I remember it's long ago. So I don't have like, my memories are not that sharp, but I just remember like, the feeling of that cramp in my right arm because it was a Formula Ford. It was like the H pattern and I was so close to the wheel and the, the gear shift lever, I, I could barely shift and I would sometimes go like from third gear to second instead of fourth because I was so like cramped. So I have, I have, that's one of the memories I have from it. Um, and then I trained, you know, on my dad's track and it was kind of like when I was 14, I was in ICA Junior, it was named back then. Um, and karting was becoming so expensive that, and you know, my dad was, I guess he was wealthy relatively to the average income, you know, in France, but he, like running a racetrack was a, a decent living, but we were not very rich at the scale of racing, right? So my dad was like, yeah, with, with the price that karting is starting to cost, we need to, to kind of stop and let's train you at the track in the cars and go to do the, the Miguel shout out, shootout, which was kind of like the, the road to Indy shootout uh, back then in France and it was fairly cheap to enter and it was like, let's try to get you ready so you have a shot at winning that and then we can get like, get on with scholarships and uh, I finished second, didn't win, got a small scholarship and then we, we found a, a few sponsoring budgets to start in uh, what was named Formula Campus back then, which is like French Formula 4 now and um, and then, yeah, I finished second in that. And then I actually got a proper scholarship from that to go Formula Renault and so on. But uh, uh, yeah, so I guess, yeah, 12 years old is the first time I got into a race car. The first race, I was 16. And from that first time, I mean, the first time you sat in a cart where you just hooked, like, like this is what I'm going to do. Um, if everything works out, this is what I'm going to do with my life. Um, later on, because I think my dad, to be honest, was quite pessimistic in the way that he did. it's not that he didn't really believe in me, but he, I think, you know, regarding our, just our financial situations, he just didn't see a way to make it work, right? It was like, um, and it was like, in USA, you have the road to Indy, but in, in Europe, you know, you had... Back then, like the, the Red Bull Junior thing was actually just starting to be big. And uh, I think there was Renault driver development that was starting to, but aside of that, there was no real, you know, ways to finance yourself up there. So he was always like, yeah, you know, like this is, you know, we got to give it everything. But remember at the moment, this is kind of a dream. Like, you know, reality is your school and your grades and, you know, having a diploma and a job and, and studying and, uh, and the racing will go as far as we can, but you don't, don't, he, he was kind of like trying, I guess he didn't want to have me disappointed or, you know, like seeing that if it didn't work out, you know, like that was kind of my real life not working out, you know? So, <laughs> um, I, I'd say, I think when I actually finished second in the Miguel shootout, they were like, okay, well, he's actually probably has what it takes to make it, you know? And then step by step, it's kind of like, okay, well, with the way things are going, he's actually like with the talent, like the results he's showing, like, fuck, he could actually, sorry, I'm person. He could actually, uh, oh, that's fine. He, he could actually get a, a, a proper career. So it kind of built up. But for me, I'd say uh, Formula 4, Formula Campus is when I was like, yeah, okay, I like I can make it. So I really got to give it a go. Yeah. So what, at what point did the progression kind of happen going from racing in Europe to America? Like how did the whole America thing come come about? When I ran out of money in Europe, <laughs> to be honest, <laughs> to be fully transparent, it's like, um, you know, growing in Europe, you know, a, a kid who tells you like, oh, I, I grew up racing in Europe and my dreams always been IndyCar. There, there are some, but most of them like will be lying. When you grow up in Europe, you watch F1, right? Like, and F1 right. is your goal. And it's kind of like, you know, 2008, we got hit pretty hard and, and I kind of lost all of the financial backing I had from our few sponsors. Not that, not that I had a lot, but we, we lost all of that in 2008 with the financial crisis. And then it's like, okay, 
F one's not gonna work out. It's just as simple as that, right? So what do we do? And then also I had kind of missed the um, missed the opportunity to like jump on the train of like Red Bull driver development or Renault driver development or something like that. I had gotten really close, but I didn't make it. And it's like, well, there's not a pass to Formula One, but in USA there's that road to Indy thing, which uh, back then was the Mazda road to Indy. It's like there's that road to Indy thing where there's a scholarship every time you win a championship and you go to the next level. So what do we do? Like, and it's kind of like, well, it doesn't really matter as how low you start. Even if you start in like USF 2000, you get money to go Star Mazda. And then if you win Star Mazda, you can go to Indy Lights or it was Formula Atlantic back then when we started looking. And so it's like, there's actually, it only relies on you winning, right? Which is not that easy, but it's like, okay. So then we, uh, in 2009, we looked into it, but I guess we had not really swallowed the pill of F1 yet. So I, I, I went to race in, in England in Formula Palmer Audi, which would, if you would win, you would get a scholarship to go to Formula 2, like that, that kind of new Formula 2 they had created back then, where it was kind of a spec series where everybody had the same car and the organizer was running all the cars. It was organized by uh, Jonathan Palmer. And um, I almost won the championship, the Formula Palmer, but I, yeah, I lost it in the last race. And uh, so then that didn't work out. And I actually did one race in that Formula 2 series, the last race of the season where I did really well and got a podium. Um, but I didn't have any scholarship or nothing. We couldn't pay for the season the following year. And I guess the podium kind of, and, and the economy getting back to a bit better at the end of 2009 got a bit of, enthusiasm back with like the few sponsors we had and we managed to gather a bit of money to yeah, it was equivalent of doing half a season in uh, star mazda which is now indie pro uh and um we came to do a test with uh anderson racing and i had seen that you know dan um Dan, you know, like was supporting some drivers in the previous years from Europe that he really liked and stuff. So I said, okay, well, let's go with that team. Obviously, they have really good cars and stuff. Let's, I did a good job at the test. And then they made us an offer where I will go like a bit beyond like the half of the season. And I was like, yeah, let's do it. And if I do well, maybe like Dan will keep me on board, like uh, as he has done from some previous drivers. So... I, uh, I signed with them uh, and by the time where the days on the contract came to like, I had to come up with this much more money to keep going, right, per the contract. By the time that date came, I was, I had won like two races and I was kind of in the fight for the title. So I, I don't remember exactly what I owed that. It was 60000 or $80,000 to keep going. And I went like, look, if if we win the, ch I had made like a kind of a spreadsheet on paper, like, like an extra <laughs> spreadsheet. I was like, well, if you cut the contract now, like we will not get anything. If I win the championship, like we get a hundred grand, which you keep. Uh, if I finish second, I think it was 60. So look at all the breakdown works. And I mean, we have a shot at the title and like, you should really keep me. And if I give you, I think I worked out that I had to give him 25 or $30,000, then you're at break even if you finish in the top three or something like that. So I worked out a number and came up with $20,000 or something, and he kept me on board for the rest of the year. Um, we didn't win the championship, actually. <laughs> we had a couple of mechanical failures and stuff, but it put me in a good spot for the following year where JDC Motorsports, uh, which is the team I actually run now in, in DPI, uh, they were having a good team in Star Mazda. And they, um, I think every year they had like one driver to who they would like kind of subsidize a deal a little bit. So they made me an offer for fairly, fairly cheap, same kind of deal at the start of the year. We didn't have all the money, but we signed. And as the year went on, like we, came up with a bit more money to buy more new tires and new engines. Cause back then you had to change the engine every two, three or four races to be competitive. Um, and we won the championship. So, and then the rest, it's like, I got that money to go to Indy lights and then I won Indy lights and I got that money to go to Indy car. So then it kind of took care of itself. I could afford an apartment in St. Petersburg, Florida mm -hmm. here. Cause the previous two years I was living at a friend, uh, the guy who actually used to, kind of partially run the team for Dan Anderson. Uh, so no, it was cool. Like 
winning the I'd say winning the Star Mazda has been really a defining moment for for the rest, you know. Yeah. Was it I and I didn't have a chance to do research on it. Was it a pretty tough title fight or what was it pretty much your year? No, it was tough. Uh, I was fighting with Conor Di Filippi, who now runs for BM, uh, the factory driver in, in IMSA and other series. Um, it was very tight um, all season. Then I think we had, uh, yeah, the second to last race, we kind of were in a shootout at Baltimore, where it was like the guy who would win the race would really have a, a, a upper hand going into the season finally. And I was leading. He was second and it was like, I would pull away. He would catch me. There was the gap was maybe mm -hmm. one, one and a half seconds. And then he, uh, actually I look in my mirror and I don't see him. And he had like crashed in like a very fast chicane. And I mean, to be honest, we were pushing so hard that it was either going to be him or me crashing probably because <laughs> we were so much on the edge on that track. Um, and then that it, it allowed me to go into the last race of the season, having I just had to start basically to win it. But until that point, it was, yeah, it was really, really tight. Yeah. What was it like when you kind of realized that, hey, my, you know, I am going to get to run in major league auto racing, you know, not that, not that Star Mazda and Indy Lights and all that's not, but I mean, you're getting ready to run at the top of the, of the sport. Uh, to be honest, I think the, when I won that race in Baltimore and I knew that I had it in the bag going into the, the last race of the season, I think if I look at all my, my journey in racing, it's one of the moments that sticks out the most as far as the relief and the feeling of joy, you know, of being like, wow, like this is big. Um, just because I, I think in racing, like getting out of those junior formulas is almost the toughest, right? Because it's, yeah. it's so tight. There's so such a big pool of talent that I don't know. I kind of, I didn't feel like then it would take care of itself. But from all the moments I can remember, it's one of the strongest as far as feeling like, okay, yeah, we made it. Like we, we made a huge step. So um, it was... Yeah, it was just great because it's kind of like you're in Europe in Formula Renault and hoping to get to the big cars like the World Series by Renault or something. Then you're in Formula Palmer hoping to get to the Formula 2 cars. And, you know, and then finally you're in Star Mazda and it works out. So, um, yeah, I guess that's that's the moment where I felt like, OK, no, I'm in kind of getting into the big league stuff, you know. Yeah. Would you would you have been in and this is probably an unfair question, but would you have been happy in F1 if you just became. You know, unfortunately, one of the one of the test drivers, the the guys who they go out and do all the mule runs and all the heavy lifting, uh, would that have been something you that you would have been satisfied with at least at the time? Because you're part of F1, or or running in IndyCar, did you feel was a better? Uh, I think thing your everyday you. life is better when you're a driver in IndyCar. Um, but I think there's something about F1 like that everybody wants to be part of it, right? But I think being a test driver, uh, you know, 10, 15 years from now was pretty awesome still. You were driving the car a lot. You were actually, your role was very significant. But being a test driver nowadays, where you spend most of the year in the simulator and the rest of the time at the track with a headset on, you know, kind of, I guess, trying to be useful, but I don't know, like, it's, uh, I think it's a very difficult position for drivers because you're there, you know, hoping to get that shot. But um, then you also have situations like look at us with Magnussen, you know, like they have Pietro as the reserve driver, but then something happens and Magnussen gets the call, you know, and you're like, wow, all those years waiting, you know, on the timing stand uh, to get in the car half a day of testing and then just let, like... I, I I I understand Hassi's decision. Eh? You know, there's, uh, I'm not criticizing that. I'm just I'm just feeling for. I'm like if I were in that sure. position, like Pietro's position. So um, it's a tough question because I think you know being part of F1, it's so big that everybody you know would like to be part of it. But I think to be honest, like having a career in IndyCar, even in IMSA, like where I'm at, where you run against some of the best still and you you run on awesome race tracks in pretty awesome race race cars it's for me it's it's plenty you know it's great yeah. 
So having dr- driven Star Mazda to Indy Lights and then to IndyCar, like, do you feel like the progression from one car to another was equal between all three of those? Like, or was IndyCar just like a like a big jump, like almost like two steps, if that makes sense? Yeah, IndyCar was a bigger jump. Not not only just the car, just as a driver, all the things you have to manage. Like, sure. in you got to manage pit stops. You got to understand all the races unfold with strategy because even if you're not the one doing the strategy, it helps you manage your race, you know, to understand how things are going to unfold. Um, just the length of the races and the overall racing. Like, I think, especially back then, with the way the cars were, Indy Lights did not prepare you that well for Indy Car because the cars were too easy to drive. They were very stable, very understeery. Um, you could run easily too wide around Indianapolis Motor Speedway, flat out all the way, which is far from being the case in an Indy Car. Um, Pit stops on Noval track are really tricky, like pitting with a car that's not symmetrical, getting to your pit box with a steering wheel that feels completely messed up. And um, so, no, definitely the the jump from Indy Lights to Indy Car was much bigger for me. There was also all the off-track aspects, like all the stuff you have to manage outside of the car, like you have much more demands. Um, you barely have time to eat sometimes. You gotta go de- do this thing, that thing for the sponsor or for the. Um, so the the yeah, there's a much more much more on your mind actually. It's uh, it's and then you have much less time to get into your zone kind of to when it's time to go and qualifying or race. So I found that difficult as a rookie. Uh, to my it's it's a lot thrown at you as a rookie and. Uh, it's kind of yeah a, a lot to take on uh, for me. I was actually the hardest part. The hardest part was managing my race weekends, you know, outside of the car, kind of, you know, all that stuff. Yeah. Well, what was your first kind of experience at the Indy 500 like for you? I mean, obviously, you had experience driving on the track in the um, Indy Lights cars, but I guess what kind of was like that whole, you know, going through the qualifying weekend. You know, all the fans, I mean, it's completely a different animal compared to all the other IndyCar races. It was tricky. I guess by the time qualifying day comes, you're already worn out. And by the time race day comes, you're, you're, you're done, <laughs> you know, <laughs> right. you really know, like it's um, that whole week really wears you out. Uh, so, you know, as a rookie, I, I didn't stay at the track. Like actually you should probably, cause it kind of allows you to chill out a bit more. Um, we also had a, um, we had an engine failure in Long Beach the weekend, kind of the last road course before. So I was qualifying for Indy 500 with a road course engine, which was one or two miles an hour down on the Indy spec engines. So it that made the whole thing very stressful because we were, even if there was only one or two cars getting bumped, we were at risk all the time just because the field was so tight that that tiny difference was making a lot of difference. So I think I had to... It was funny, my run that I did to qualify in P28 or something, we overlaid like the steering trace with the, the pole of Tagliani <laughs> the year, mm-hmm. one or two years before that I did with Schmidt. And that was just as much, cor- as, m- as many corrections. And the steering trace was kind of almost as straight because the car was so, you know, so edgy because we had, we, we had needed to trim it out so much to, just to make it to the field. Um, so, yeah, it was... It was a tricky week for me, um, I guess. Same a bit as what I was describing before. So much to manage outside of the car. So many debriefs with the engineers. So much stuff like that, that it, there's a lot more to it than driving. Then the race itself, it's tough as well, especially when you start at the back of the pack. Like Just going in a straight line, actually, in the first laps is not easy because there's so many turbulences with the air. And so managing, following other cars and... Um, and also managing all along the races, it's kind of like, I remember I started like really strong and you do like one, two stints and you go, you know, as a rookie, you don't necessarily think enough about managing yourself. And then I remember getting on after my second pit stop and being like, wow, I got five more of those, you know, and that's <laughs> not really long, you know, <laughs> and I was not physically tired because it's, it's not that physical. I was more mentally tired because I had been... I think I started, I started 28 and I had gotten up to at one point like 12 or like P12 or I was at least in the top 15, which it takes a lot out of you to make that happen. And it was kind of like, yeah, yeah. Like I'd probably rushed it a bit too much, but you know, it's like 
nobody nobody told you <laughs> kind of you know so uh that's uh so i remember it as something like very difficult to be honest yeah were you someone that um you know, some people get really intense and, and their heart rate gets up and, you know, when they're running through the pack. And then you got other guys who, you know, were more calm and that. Were you more of an intense guy, more up on the wheel, or were you more of the calm, more calculated in, in IndyCar? Uh, no, I, I was, I'd say, especially in my rookie year, I was more, more of the NC guy, like trying to make stuff happen and sometimes rushing too much and, um, yeah, for forgetting very often like how long the races are, you know. Um, it's one thing, you know, very often like in an Indy Lights race, very often if you don't make something happen in first two laps, it's probably not going to happen because you, you don't have pit stops, um, harder to overtake, no push to pass, and stuff like that. In IndyCar, there's a lot of opportunities in the race to make something happen. It's more, it's almost more like you have to let the race come to you and... And, you know, not necessarily save yourself, but not, you know, pick your battles kind of like not burn yourself on the wrong battles. That's something that like a guy like Dixon is really strong at, for instance. Right. And so I learned more about it, like in my second year with Coin, And then the sports car racing has been really good as well to, to just growing up in general. You know, it's like you arrive fresh from Indy Lights and you're eager to show and you... So, um, but yeah, I'd say that first year, I uh, I definitely was more on the assertive side of things, yeah. Yeah, and then you were uh, with the... You were the overall IndyCar Rookie of the Year that year, right? Sorry? The, you were the overall IndyCar Rookie of yes, the Year? Yes, yes, I was, rookie. yeah. Mm-hmm. But um, who, who were the other rookies that year? There was actually not many. Uh, uh, was there uh, Carlos Munoz? I think we were like two or three. Yeah, yeah. I think I don't. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. think I might have been the only full time guy. I'm not sure. I don't remember exactly. But we were not many. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just I, I think those rookie of the years are uh, th- those can be pretty uh, pretty intense. I think you know just because it like you were talking about it's a. Uh, it's a battle of the season, something you've never done, never done races that long. Uh, and there's so much intensity. And I, I always am interested in who the rookies of the year are and kind of where their careers go after that. Yeah, 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 for sure. So after 2013, you took a year off from IndyCar, right? You didn't race at all in 2014? You did well, some didn't sports really car? Off. Like, yeah, 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 I was out of a ride, to be honest. Uh, like, the, I had the scholarship money that year, and then the following year there was – uh, HP, who was a big sponsor of, of Schmidt Peterson back then, uh, left and kind of all the other sponsorships they have had to go to like fill up the gaps for Simon Pagano's car. And then, you know, they had the Russian money with, uh, with SMP racing and, uh, uh, Misha Alishin. So, um, I kind of didn't really have a, a choice. So yeah, I mean, as a Mazda scholarship driver from the road to Indy, I like John Duden, like uh, made me part of the sports car program part-time for the long races. And I was kind of a reserve driver for the rest of the season. So I've, I've had experience being the kind of the reserve driver as we were talking about earlier. Um, and then, um, yeah, at the end of 2014, there was not really like a spot for me at Mazda to, to go full time or, uh, and I kind of, you know, I looked for other things. I I I rest a bit in in Europe in some GT stuff, but I, to be honest, I didn't have that much going on. And then um, James Davison, who we were we were friend, we, we still are, we who we were friends, called me because he was he had a sponsor and he was doing the Indy 500, but he. He, he was also driving a GT car during the qualifying weekend. So he was like asking me if I could uh, qualify his car for him. And I said, well, yeah, of course. So I, uh, I qualified the car for him uh, at the 500 and I did pretty well. I think we qualified in like 18 or 20, something quite decent. And um, then I was actually... One or two days after qualifying, I was at Chicago O'Air on my connection to go to Europe uh, to race GTs. 
and uh, my ex-girlfriend uh, from the time uh, who was racing, uh, Ayla Agren, she calls me and she's like, hey, uh, James Inchcliffe had uh, like a huge wreck. He's not gonna, he's not likely to be in the race. Like you're the only guy out there that has, that has been doing the practice and stuff. And you're, you were driving for Sam two years ago. I, I don't see anybody else like getting the call. You, you cannot leave to Europe. So I'm like, yeah. And it was an awkward situation, right? Because it's kind of like, well, you, you have to, you have to do your job and take your shot as a driver. So I called like one of my friends at Schmidt and asked like, Hey, who is James? Like what's going on and stuff. And he told me, yeah, like he's, he's, he's going to survive and stuff. No, he, like it was, it was borderline, but he's going to survive, but he's not going to race. And so um, I pulled my luggage out, drove back to the rental car, drove back to Indy uh, and talked with Sam who said, yeah, you're on standby, but I cannot guarantee you're going to get the drive. Um, and uh, so I waited two or three days. The team in Europe was really nice because they were like, yeah, it's important for you. So we'll find a way if you cannot make it. And uh, I don't know, I think the, yeah, the Thursday before the race, so really the, the, thir the day before car day, um, Sam texts me to come to see him in his motorhome and it, it didn't sound good in my opinion. Like, and as I'm, mm -hmm. as I'm uh, walking to the motorhome, I see like the race director and he's like, what are you doing here? I thought you were in Europe. I'm like, oh, no, well, I stayed, blah, blah. And I go to the motorhome and Sam tells me like, look, we are, uh, we actually took Ryan Briscoe because he's more experienced and the sponsor wanted like a more experienced guy than you. Blah, blah. And so I get out of the motorhome and the race director is still there and he's like, hey, uh, like there is this Carlos Huertas guy who is like, he's having an inner here problem. He's not gonna, he has to pass another test, but he's not gonna make it. Like you, like you need to tell Dale Coin that you're here because everybody thinks you left to Europe. And, um, so I called Dell and he's like, yeah, okay, wow, well, I didn't know, blah, blah, blah. And uh, next thing you know, they call me that Carlos failed the test and that uh, to come like do a fitting in his car. So I'm, now I'm going to start on the last row uh, next to the car I qualified, which is on the last <laughs> row because they changed drivers, right? So, um, so I do the 500 and uh, I think the three coin cars end up running into each other in the pits because uh, Peepermans, mechanic center into James Davison and both of their cars end up spinning into mine, which was still parked in the pit box. So three cars, so it didn't go well. Uh, but then I, I stick around India after the race and I tell Dale, well, if you need a driver for Detroit, I'm here. And he says, no, we're going to be okay. Then two days later, he calls me, it's the Wednesday before Detroit. And he's like, yeah, can you come to Detroit? We're going to need someone. And then um, at Detroit, I, uh, uh, I don't know, the first race didn't go that well, but I qualified like in the top 12. And the second race, which was, I think the starting position was based on points because qualifying had been canceled. I start last and I finish fourth. So then Dale, like on that same day, told me like, okay, what are you doing the rest of the year? And I said, oh, I'm driving for you, right? And he said, okay, yeah, you are. <laughs> so that's how I got my second year in IndyCar. And um, yeah, that's it, yeah. That's a crazy story. Yeah, really. that, yeah, um, I had a lot of like uh, opportunities like that. It's uh, yeah, it's kind of yeah, it's kind of how it's going. Yeah. So then, after what was it that, like when the what sorry, was it ahead. like when the twelve R? No, oh, sorry about that, Aaron. What was it like when the twelve R Sebring? Oh, it was great because it's a track. Uh, actually, my first win in America in Star Mazda was at Sebring. Then my first pole position in IMSA was at Sebring in the Mercedes. Then I, I got a pole the following year in DPI in 2018. And uh, it's a track I've always loved. So, um, and actually the year we won was the year where most of the race we struggled for pace, but in the end it all worked out. And so it was like, uh, it was crazy because we were two laps down pretty much most of the day. We had been run into by people twice and um, it didn't look good until it looked good. So it was a, it was a kind of an emotional roller coaster, you know, that win. Yeah. So, so now obviously you're doing, um, 
the IMSA series with JDC Miller Motorsports. So, and, and you're doing the full season this year, correct? Yes. Yeah. So would you say that definitely like you're, you kind of accepted or it, it, happy with, um, you know, staying in, in that series or like if the IndyCar ride would ever come about again, would that be something that you would, you know, possibly be interested in or kind of wor- where's your view on that kind of in your career at this point? Oh, no, surely I would be interested, like if an mm-hmm. opportunity came along, but I cannot tell you that I wake up every day like having IndyCar as a goal. My goal when I wake up every day is to win in IMSA and to do as best as I can where I'm yeah. at. And then, I mean, that's when you do this, that opportunities come along. Uh, but I'm not actively pursuing like, you know, sponsorships to go back to IndyCar or to do the 500. I'm, I'm actually, I'm very actively working as hard as I can to be at the top of sports cars where I'm racing right now because I want to win the championship. Uh, I, you know, I want to win the big ones on the schedule. I haven't won Daytona yet. We were close this year, but so my, you know, if, if, if things go well and then an IndyCar opportunity will come along, I would surely consider it. But at the moment I want to, put myself in the position to have the best opportunities first off in sports cars. And then you, you never know what can happen, you know? Right. So you finished third at Daytona, then second at Sebring, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. And you guys are, are you guys leading the championship right now? Yeah, we are at the moment. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What, um, so one of the last questions I have is, um, so one of our good friends of the show is Jagger Jones, who is in the USF 2000 championship, obviously, He's, you know, trying to do the road to Indy. What would be your biggest piece of advice to anyone like that, you know, kind of starting the bottom of the road to Indy? Um, you being someone who obviously, you know, succeeded in that and was able to make it all the way up to Indy, Carly, like, what would be your biggest piece of advice? Uh, I'd say mainly, I mean, it would sound cliche and stupid, but it's like just do it one race at a time, not, not think too far ahead. Mm-hmm. But I think it creates useless pressure on yourself and expectations and, I think just, you know, they say one corner at a time, one lap at a time, but I think it's very true. I think just is just focus on your next corner and your next race and, and winning that next race and winning that next championship. And then it's crazy the way things take care of themselves when you manage to do that. Yeah, it's it's so hard to, to stay in a moment for, for anybody. And I think that's what great race car drivers are great at doing is being able to stay in the moment. And like you say, take that next corner, take that next lap, take that next race as they come. Um, and I think, I think that's really the, I mean, I think it truly to be successful, probably in anything in life, but especially in auto racing, I think that's definitely the, the way you have to view it. Yeah. I think for any athlete, like that's the hardest thing to achieve it sounds so easy but it's so hard to do but that's my biggest piece of advice for him yeah. right well i tell you it, it's been an absolute pleasure for me um you know talking to you i watch you race great race car driver um you know and i watch you in the sports cars and and uh man i just wish you guys all the best and i, I hope you guys get that championship yeah thank you and thanks for having me it's been a pleasure to me yeah mm-hmm. Well, thanks, Tristan. Yeah, best luck the rest of the year. Thank you. It sounds good. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah.